What joy to know that I do also have the privilege of opening up his word to you today. And in our parsha this week, we're, we're near the end of Shemot Exodus. We're in, in chapter 25, but you don't need to open it. Forgive me, but I've, I've summarized for sake of time. What I want to bring you to is the main thought of this parsha. The main thought is summed up in one Hebrew word, word Toruma, which means a contribution, a portion, a gift, a free will offering. Free will is where I want us to stop and to pause and to think. That makes this offering different than the other offerings. This is an offering not out of duty, not out of compulsion, not out of commandment. This is a free will offering. You know, when someone says they're a freelance writer or freelance reporter, they're on their own. They're not having to abide by someone else telling them thou shalt you have to or don't do this go there they're allowed to just freely go where they feel directed to go when we want to offer the lord a free will offering we're not doing this because we've read in a scripture verse thou shalt we're not doing it as the children of israel who brought sacrifices in continually bought, brought first fruits into the lord continually made those contributions and gave and that all is wonderful too don't under, misunderstand me but i want to focus on that free will offering because in this parasha the lord offered the people a chance to out of their hearts give an offering to him he told moshe to tell them and the quote that i will give is from every man whose heart moves him from every man whose heart moves him you provide the materials for the mishkan for the tabernacle for the mishkan kadosh for the holy temple can you imagine put yourself in their place they are building a place they know that it, it, we call it the tabernacle they're calling it the Mishkan. The root of that word, as we've looked at in the past weeks, is to dwell. This is what they're building, a place for God to dwell, to dwell with them. Remember, our word Shechina comes out of this, Shechan, it comes out of this root. So the glory of our God, a place for his glory to dwell. Now, we know his glory dwells everywhere but this is a place where he's going to confine it he's going to bring it he's going to bring it into the holy of holies he's going to show it in the manifestation of the pillar of cloud by day and, and fire by night this is going to be the place though two main things are happening in this place in this mishkan one is it's a place where the sacrifices are offered to god not just the free will sacrifices. This is going to be where the sacrifices that they are commanded to give, but it's also the place where God is going to communicate with his people. He's going to inhabit the same space with them. There is a relationship here. There is a, a coming and going here that brings them into being able to be in, in the presence of God in a, in a more I don't want to say tangible way, but something they could see, something they could relate to. What a privilege. What an honor. If we were to have the opportunity right now, if the Lord said to us, build the fourth temple that I'm going to dwell in, build it for my glory, bring what you have as your heart moves you to build it, what would you bring to it? Would you hurry with excitement, gathering up your gold and your silver and your precious stones, your jewels and all that you have, and run to the area where they're building it and look for that special place to put that that was precious to your heart that now you've given to the Lord? This is what they were having an opportunity to do. They were going to have an opportunity to see something that they gave to the Lord, make his place shine. How do we do that today? Because we don't have a temple. 
and we're not in Israel where the temple will be built. And the temple that's going to be so glorious is going to be built by the Lord He Himself in the millennial, not the temple that's going to be desecrated by Satan and his henchmen in the tribulation. How do we do that? How do we see? I'm reminded. Remember when we took the tabernacle from Bereshit to Revelation and we saw that we are a tabernacle. He is inhabiting us. He's dwelling with us. How do we make ourselves more beautiful for him? Is it putting, forgive me guys, the makeup on this morning? <laughs> is it wearing our earrings? Is it making our hair look just right? All of those things that we worry about when we're making an appearance for someone else. That's not the true glories, is it? It's the jewels of the heart. It's adorning the inside. And I realize, Lord, I've got nothing worthy, but you're in me. That's where the worthiness comes. You do it, Lord. You glorify yourself. You make this a jewel. And forgive me, but because of who I am, Lord, make this a pearl like none other. Because I know the pearly gates entering into your presence are gorgeous beyond compare. So I have to personalize it. And I ask him, Lord, make me a gem for you. Make me something beautiful for you. This is the giving of the heart. This is the heart welling up and wanting to glorify my Lord. I'm in your glory, Lord. Let it shine. Let it shine. That's what I see. Yes, there were roles. Yes, there were first fruits. Yes, there were offerings. And oh, by the way, for those of you tied to a number, the 10th is only the beginning. They were to give a tenth, but they gave so much more above and beyond that tenth. And anyone who confines himself to, okay, here's the formula. I get X amount. I give X amount. I've done my duty. That's duty. That's not the offering that the Lord's talking about in this parsha. That's not the giving as the heart moves us. That's not the giving from the heart. Let's look at that giving. Let's look at that heart. Let's look at those words. There is a word in Hebrew that you, again, are very familiar with it. It's sadaka, our sadaka box that you put your offerings into. Sadaka, though, when we get into the pure form, means righteousness. A righteous person in Judaism, they call him a sadik. If, if you were a sadik, you would most likely be the most revered rabbi among them, one who you know is really seeking to please his God, one who's trying to be like his God, one who is being a good religious leader, a spiritual leader, maybe I should say, but in it, as they look at it from Judaism, they're still seeing it as the religious obligation. This is how they should be. This is what God wants. And they emphasize that's living a spiritual life. That's where they begin to move from the ritual and the religion into that more accurate meaning, which is relationship. And they, if they're living out a spiritual life, they're having righteous behavior. They're dealing in righteousness and in justice. Then they get that title, Sadiq. And it's because they're looking at that word Sadaka. But remember, Sadaka is our giving, our charitable giving, our giving out of a heart full of love. And they have a hard time balancing it. So do I as I try to bring it to you. Yes, we have a moral obligation. He is our God. He has provided us with everything. We want to give him a part of what he's given to us. We want to show him that. But this level of giving is not, it is above that. This is a, a spontaneous act. This is when your heart suddenly shouts out, oh, praise you, God. And you're feeling something stirring within that, that you just have to praise his holy name. 
You just have to bring him a sacrifice of something. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's a spontaneous act. It's not just that Jewish obligation. It's not just that, that mitzvah, that good deed. It goes beyond that good deed. Now, in our good deeds, in our actions, in our moral obligations, we should be living that life that is important. But our people look at this act of, I'm, I'm going to say charity in action, and they look at it as equal to all the other mitzvah, all the other good deeds, all the other commandments, put them all together. And an act of sadaka, an act of this righteous, spontaneous giving from the heart, they equal it with all the other combined. That's the goal that they want to get to and they want to attain. And that's what I believe God is touching on in this is that he wants it out of the heart. Remember, he didn't make Adam and Eve, Chava. He didn't make them puppets. You will love me. I will pull your string and you will say, I love you. I'm here to do what you tell me to do. I will do this. I will do that. <laughs> God could have made us that way, but he didn't. He put a free will into us. He gave us the ability to have a heart want to turn to him and love him and express it. And this is what he is looking for. Our Jewish people in Judaism put this right up on the same level as being repentant before God and saying our prayers is just as important. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, but you've got to have this other part also. They call it the ethos. The ethos is like the, the um, it, it's the spirit. So I'm going to say it's your character, your spirit. It, it's, it's coming from within. It's not coming from the, the obligations on the outside. It's coming from within. I could say medot halev. Medot halev means the, the quality of the heart, the quality of what's being given, that righteous soul that's acting and giving to others, but especially giving to our God. There's a revered rabbi in the second century, Rabbi Yehuda. And he, I, I'm going to read you his quote. It, it's very interesting. Don't miss the end, the, the key end, okay? Because that's the whole crux of what's important in this. But he said there are 10 hard things that have been created in the world. The rock is hard but iron shatters it. Iron is hard, but fire softens it. Fire is powerful, but water extinguishes it. Water is heavy, but clouds carry it. Clouds are thick, but wind scatters them. Wind is strong, but a body resists it. The body is strong, but fear crushes it. Fear is powerful, but wine banishes it. Wine is strong, but sleep works it off. Death is stronger than all. Yet sadaka, charity, righteousness, hard love delivers from death. Very interesting. If you could stop and dwell on that, it's very interesting, the process, but the end note that he comes up with, that sadaka, love, charity, love of the heart, express, this delivers from death. He drew that right from Proverbs 10 too. You can look it up later and at the end of, of it does say that, that this love delivers from death. Well, was Rabbi Yehuda correct? Did it come to the right sum? Sadaka, charity, sacrificial giving from the heart. Is this a righteousness that delivers from death? If it is, it has to be a sacrificial act, which means is a deliverance for someone else. 
It's not a deliverance for ourselves. We have to look beyond ourselves to see where this is. And if we can find that, I guarantee you that is that would be the greatest gift ever given. Now, if you're thinking, if you're ahead of me, and I hope you are, you're thinking to yourself, well, Rochelle, I know the greatest gift ever given. And it was sacrificial. And it did conquer death. I get it. I know who you're talking about. I can picture this gift. I know the answer is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. And I will tell you, crown, A plus, right on, you got it. That sacrificial act out of the heart of God delivers us from death. The greatest gift ever given. Oh, wow. Yes, Mashiach lived a sodic life. Yes, he is righteous. Yes, he is righteousness in action that delivers us from death. You see, God in his faithfulness, he determined to carry out his plan to redeem his fallen people. And if that isn't love, what is? What is? God didn't say, I'm done with you people. I'll go create something else. He could have done that, but he didn't. He chose, and I'll say it again, his faithfulness determined to carry out his plan to redeem his people. How do we see that in scripture? How do we know that? There's something called the scarlet thread that runs through scripture. As soon as I say scarlet thread, I hope you see it as like a, a thread of blood, a line of blood, because that's what it is representing and what it's meaning. And as we look, we will see that theme run all the way through scripture so that whatever book you open up, you will see the scarlet thread somewhere in that book and often more than one somewhere running all the way through again from Bereshit to Revelation because we have one book, one continuous story. We have the precious word of God. Oh, in the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. And suddenly I'm not talking about black and white words on paper, but I'm talking about Yeshua from Bereshit to the revelation of himself. Oh, hallelujah, that he would gift us so. All I can do in the confinement of time, I hate the clock. I, I would like there to be just one clock in heaven that God puts at my foot and lets me kick it like the football star where it goes right out of eternity <laughs> and it's gone and vanished forever. I will, I would rejoice to kick that clock out, but God did it for me. So since I'm not there yet, let me take you quickly through just a couple of the highlights, but let me encourage you, ask the Lord, show me your scarlet thread in scripture and see where he takes you this week. See what new thoughts you get. But I'm going to hit on a few highlights. I'm going to start in Bereshit, a very good place to start in the beginning. But I'm going to take you all the way to chapter 38. Now, let me say right away, um, go all the way back to, to chapter 3. Go back to the first sin. Go back to the fact that God covered Adam and, and Eve with skins from an animal which speaks to shed blood in the picture of the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb that we know is a picture of Messiah. So we see it in chapter three, but I want to jump to chapter 38 because I want to show you something that that's not quite as obvious for you, but let me get you started off right. When you start with the scarlet thread, you start in the third chapter. Do you realize how quickly God's showing that to mankind? He made mankind in chapter one. He gave us more detail of how he made him in chapter two. And then in chapter three, he's already gifting us with this gift of his sacrificial blood, the blood that was shed. When we get to chapter 38, 
read on your own later, verses 27 to 30. What it's talking about there is the birth of twins. It's talking about Zerah and Perez. Now, if you were with us during the week, coincidentally enough, I love the way God brings it all together. Pastor Gil talked to us about Perez and his little joke of the first Sephardic Jew <laughs> before there was a, a, a Spain, before there was a Jew, but I love it. I'll, I'll let him have it. <laughs> but when we read those verses, the Ra is the one who reached out of the birth canal. He reached out with his hand. The midwife put a scarlet thread around his hand, but then that went back into the canal and out comes Perez. He wasn't going to let his brother come out first. And Perez is the one who comes out so that he would be the firstborn. Now, remember in Jewish genealogy, firstborn is critical. Firstborn carries the birthright. Firstborn has the family name. It firstborn is of utmost importance. That's why when you see the upsets like Yaakov being put into the position of firstborn because Esau cast it out. That's why you see these changes that are so critical because God works as he pleases. God had chosen Perez to be firstborn, not Zerah, because Perez is the line that will carry down all the way to Mashiach, to Messiah. So we see right away, and by the way, if you want where he's in Messiah's line, you go into the Brit Chadashah, go into Matthew, right in the very beginning, that sneak peek that, that tells every Jewish person, look at, here's our Jewish genealogy. What's it doing in that quote, as they say, Christian book? No, that is a Hebrew Christian book, and it's a continuation, and Matthew 1 verse 3 tells us about Perez, the same Perez we're reading out about in Bereshit in Genesis 38 verses 27 to 30. Perez was the one to be firstborn. He was the one that the line was going to come through. He was the one that God chose. I'm jumping quickly, and trust me, I'm not going through 66 examples. That's on your own, your homework. But let's go to Shemot. Let's go to Exodus. We'll go to Exodus chapter 26, and we'll go to verse 1. This is part of our parasha this week also. This is the tabernacle curtains. The tabernacle curtains are being made with all kinds of colors, the gold speaking the deity, the blue speaking of the heavenly origin. Remember, the original tabernacle is in heaven. No one except Moshe has seen the original they built after the pattern that God showed Moshe. He showed him the heavenly one. The blue to remind us that it's heavenly. The purple to remind us it is a kingly position. The king is sitting on the throne in the tabernacle. And then there's another color woven into this curtain. And this curtain is going to be the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the holy place. So it's leading right into where the Shekhinah glory of God would dwell, leading right into the most holy presence, leading to where the blood of the sacrifice was to be put, where on the mercy seat. It's leading right into the very mercy of our God. It is where we are atoned for through the shed blood. And there's your color. Scarlet was worked into that curtain. That color to me, I was going to say it's the most important color, but I can't say that. The gold, the purple, the blue are just as important. But God saw to it that there was a scarlet thread running through the curtain that opens away to his mercy seat to his very presence. Jump with me to Yahshua, Joshua chapter two and verse 18. Again, thank you, Pastor Gil, for prepping us, for getting us ready, for bringing it all together because we're just looking at other angles of the same story. And here we have the time and we haven't finished it yet. We'll be on it this week also in our Bible studies. But here is the time that Yahshua, Joshua is going to bring them into their first battle, the battle of Jericho, the battle of Jericho, where the walls are going to come tumbling down. You know the story well. In chapter two and verse 18, we have the part telling us about the spies. The spies are going to be let down outside of Rahab's window because she's living on the wall. You know, walls back in those days were not like our little narrow walls. They were so thick that chariots could race on those walls. 
on the wall, you could build a house. And her house was on the very wall of the city of Jericho. So her window was the outside or led to the outside of the city wall. And when the spies that she had hidden that showed her faith in who they, their God was, it was a scarlet rope that was put out. I don't think that's coincidental for a moment. I think that's God ordained. I don't know all the colors of ropes they had. I don't know whether they had any other color, but the scripture made sure, or the author of the scripture made <clears throat> sure that in our historical um, <coughs> book, in the, in the writing, the word scarlet would be put in there. Every word in the Bible is important. We don't want to miss a word. This was a scarlet rope because this is showing us the thread coming down, the scarlet thread. In verse 21 is where she immediately lets them down in with that scarlet rope, rope, excuse me. And she had made one request when your God conquers the city spare me and spare my family. And the spies had told her, put this cord outside your window. And when we conquer, you will, and all who are in your house, not anyone outside of the house, not her family, wherever they were, they had to be in the house. They would be the ones that would be rescued. And we know that she put that rope out. That was a sign of her faith in the salvation of their God. It wasn't her God. It was, we've heard about your God. We've heard about the feats at the ATS that have been accomplished. We know there's a power in your God. Rahab is coming to that saving faith of the God of Israel. And it did lead to her salvation physically. And I believe absolutely spiritually, because I believe she is showing her faith in the God of Israel. She is joining in as a proselyte to Judaism later would do. So when we see that scarlet thread on the outside of her house, what does it remind us of? Let's back up slightly in Shemot, in Exodus to chapter 12. Go to verse 13 in particular on your own later and read it. Chapter 12 is the background for the instructions for Pesach, for Passover. This is talking about put the blood on the doorposts. And remember, because I don't have time to expound, just remember once the blood was put on the doorposts of the house, and we know the whole picture is Yeshua, it's his atoning blood, it's the picture of the gate to life and from the Hebrew, all of that. But the, the ones who were inside the house behind that blood were the ones who would be saved. And the commandment went out, once the blood has been put on the doorposts of the home, you go in and no one is to go out of the house. If they went out of the house, they are out of the protection of God. Not that he could not save, but he chose not to save anyone outside of the blood. They had to be behind that blood. It led to their salvation. It led to no death on the firstborn in that home. Remember, we're talking about the heart, the sacrifice, the death. But what delivers is that love, delivers from death. God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God showing Racha, a harlot. Hello? She wasn't Sadiq. She wasn't living a righteous life. She didn't earn this protection, this gift of life. She did nothing to deserve it. Oh, how that gives me a thrill that I don't have to learn how to be so holy, to earn my favor with God that he might, okay, I'll let this one in. Where would you ever draw the line of knowing that you were holy enough, righteous enough, living perfectly enough, that a holy God would say, okay, you know, man, makes those distinctions. God says, you break one sin, 
one commandment, you've broken them all. You need forgiveness. He never says, earn it, work for it. He tells us after we're saved to work out the gift we've been given, but he never tells us to earn it. And we see through a harlot's salvation how God saves us all, not on the merit of who we are, but on the merit of his faithfulness and his love. Well, the Bible's theme, Yeshua, our Messiah, Yeshua, our sacrifice for redemption of mankind, the blood of Messiah is that scarlet thread. Quickly, chapters to look at later. Genesis chapter four, we have Aval's sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that was acceptable to the Lord. He was bringing a, an animal, a, a sheep from his herd. It was the shed blood. And some believe this was even on Mount Moriah. I'm not here to argue that, but we know there was shed blood later on Mount Moriah that bought us all our salvation. But Genesis 4, we see the blood of a sacrificed animal picturing this. Um, we see, I, I forgot to tell you, but I mentioned it earlier, prior to chapter 4, in chapter 3, verse 21 in particular, is when God provides the garments for Adam and Eve. It does not spell out that it was an animal sacrifice, but how do you have the skins if the animal had not been sacrificed? The bloodshed, we see it picked up in chapter 4 that Aval knew what type of sacrifice to make. He must have been taught. He must have seen the example jump forward to Genesis, Bereshit chapter 22. This is called the Akita. This is Avraham willing to offer up Yitzhak, but a ram, which is a lamb in the lamb family, a ram is provided by God instead, picturing how God himself would provide, how God himself is the provision. Shemot, Exodus 12, 13, the blood on the doorposts, bringing that home, the Passover lamb. And then we see, if you've missed it in picture form, if you've not caught on through the original covenant, we go into the Brit in Luke chapter 22 and verse 30, and we see him very clearly in the midst of Pesach, in the Passover Seder, taking the cup called the cup of redemption and saying, this is my blood which is shed for you. Knowing he is the lamb of God, here is that sacrificial blood being shed. This will give, give us the remission of our sins, Luke 22. Let me read it to you though from our original covenant also. Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read seven and eight and 12. Though mistreated, he was submissive. He did not open his mouth like a lamb led to be slaughtered, like a sheep silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. After forcible arrest and sentencing, he was taken away and none of his generation protested his being cut off from the land of the living for the crimes of my people who deserved the punishment themselves. I brought this to you in a different version so you can maybe hear it a little easier to understand and get the fullness of the picture. Notice that this one is like a sheep. He is going to be cut off. That's the same word in Daniel 9, cut off violently. 9.24 when it was telling us Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Verse 8 says it's for the crimes of my people. And yes, it's the crimes of Israel, but we know it was not the Jews only. It was the crimes of all mankind that God has made. Male, female, rich, poor, black, white, Jew, Gentile, all of it. These is who. They deserve the punishment. He put it on himself. Verse 12. Therefore will I assign him a share with the great. He will divide the spoil with the mighty for having exposed himself to death and being counted among the sinners while actually bearing the sin of many and interceding for the offenders. In his death, shedding his blood, he interceded for the offenders. Wow, that greatest gift ever given. 
the whole of the sacrificial system, the whole institution of it, the thousands of years, the thousands and thousands of sacrifices all performed at the tabernacle, then at the temple, every single one of those sacrifices all the way from the time of Moshe, all the way we come to Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. And we hear that, that quote that I love in chapter one of John, verse 29, he sees Yeshua approaching. He's not looking at a lamb bah, out there eating, grazing. He sees a man in appearance coming. He points to him and says, behold, hello, are you paying attention? Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. What? A sentence. Here's our scarlet thread running all the way through. And then we see Yeshua himself speaking on that cross in the midst of dying on the execution stake. And what does he say? Yochanan, John quotes it in chapter 19 and verse 30, the very word of Yeshua. He says, it is finished. Oh, how I rejoice at that. He doesn't say, now you've got this, now go and do A, B, C, D. And if you're fortunate enough to get to Z before you die, you might get allowed into God's presence. No, he says, it's done. It's over. It's finished. It's completed. In our Greek that we have it quoted in, it's tetelestai. I love the Greek for this because English only has past, present, and future. Greek has something that's called a perfect active tense. And it takes us and says, when, it, when he said it is finished, that was a point in time. In geometry, it's the dot on the page. But then you have to draw that arrow that goes into <coughs> infinity that you never have an end to. And that's the tense, this perfect active. When the Lord said it is finished, he's saying it is done and the results continue forever. Does that mean they continue to February 5th, 2022? Yes, yes. And they will continue on until we are all home in the eternal glory, not just us being raptured, but it continues on all the way through till God rolls up this plan in Revelation 21, makes the new heavens and the new earth that are going into an eternity that we only have a bare outline of, but it goes all the way to there. Our book written to our Hebrew people in the Brit Hadashah, Hebrews chapter nine and verse 22, so key. 8, 9, and 10 explode all over this, but just jumping because, again, I'm looking at that clock. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, period. It didn't say bow down to this idol, bring in your first fruits, do this or do that. There are many things we should do, absolutely, but for the forgiveness, it has to be the shedding of blood. The conclusion is that the scarlet thread is the theme of atonement found throughout the pages of scripture. No matter what book you pick up, when you see the scarlet thread, look for how it is a picture of the atoning blood of Yeshua, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. Why? Because that's all that can satisfy the holy and perfect God is holy and perfect blood. Viacra Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. God is speaking. God, when did you put the blood on the atonement seat? When did you put the blood on the mercy seat in the tabernacle? When did you do that? And you say you did it for it's the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Without blood, there isn't life. Without this blood put on the mercy seat, there isn't the atonement. There isn't the at one with God. There isn't the eternal life with him. When God did you put blood there? Do we see him 
come down and pick a lamb out of the flock and say that's it? No, that's not perfect. That's not sinless. That's a picture, but that's all it is. That's a shadow. Where is the reality? Remember Yochanan's words? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yochanan was foreshadowing what Messiah would do three and a half years later when his blood would be put on the mercy seat in heaven, not in the, tab or the temple on earth. It would be placed in heaven. Why? Because it's heaven that needs to be opened to us, not an earthly location. If we're going to be able to spend <coughs> eternity in God's presence in his home, the blood had to open the way into heaven. So why paradise wasn't in heaven before this point. It was in the heart of the earth. It was a, a paradise, but it was waiting the greater home. This is where the blood was placed in the temple in the earthly temple at the time at the blood being placed being well i shouldn't say being placed because it wasn't exactly then but the blood being shed that's when the curtain that has that scarlet thread that we talked about in schmote early on in, the, in my my message today that curtain was split wide open it was so thick thicker than a man's hand. It was at least 18 inches thick. That's a foot and a half thick. This is curtain material. Take a phone book 18 and a half inches and try to rip it, let alone material. And then it's high above man, taller than man, taller than the priest that was working in the temple. And it's torn from top to bottom. How did that happen? At the hand of God, ripping open the veil and saying, now you can come into my very presence through the scarlet thread, the shed blood of Yeshua, the Lamb of God. I'm reminded of, of Psalm 22, Tehillim 22. Why? Because this is a picture of crucifixion. This is a picture of our Lord on the cross that we read about later in the Brita Chadashah. And I, I see it, it much in the description. If you read Psalm 22, everyone says, this is what happens in crucifixion. But I'm taking you because we're following our theme to verse six. Verse six, we have, God is the one speaking. He says, but I am a worm, not a man scorned by everyone despised by the people. Why is he calling himself a worm? We thought he was a man. What's he saying to us? Of course he was a man, the holy man, the perfect man, but he's drawing the attention away from that to show us that he was the worm that is called the scarlet worm, the crimson worm, the Hebrew word tola ot. You've heard me share it before. I'm going to just in highlight real fast, give you this tola ot, this, this um, crimson, worm. crimson worm, I'm sorry. Crimson worm. Crimson worm. Not the usual generic worm. This, that would be Rima. This was one that looked more like even a grub than a worm. Why is God saying he's a worm? But when we look at what the tola ot does, we look at the life, we see the female, that has babies. She only does it one time in her life. She finds a tree trunk. She attaches herself to, to the trunk, to the wood. She makes a hard crimson sh shell out of her body. She is so strongly and so permanently stuck to this tree that she would literally have to be torn apart, her body torn to remove her from that tree. She lays her eggs under that protective shell of her body. And when her babies hatch, her body is not only their protection, but it provides them with food. They literally feed off of the living body of their mother. After a few days, the babies are able to take care of themselves. And the mother has literally given her life to bring her babies to life. And she dies as mama crimson worm dies, she oozes a scarlet, a crimson dye, red dye. It stains the tree trunk. 
it stains also her young ones. They will be red, crimson, scarlet, the scarlet worm, all their lives. They will carry that color. After three days, is that not very interesting? After three days, the dead mother crimson worm's body loses that crimson color. It turns into a white wax that falls to the ground like snow. Do you hear Isaiah 118? Come, let us reason together, though your sins be like crimson, they will be white as snow. That is amazing. That white wax has medicinal properties in it. One of the things it is good for is the regulation of the heart beat. Oh, is this not amazing? And it also can be used as a preservative for wood, as a shellac that is is strong. Wow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But I am a worm. That's what he was pointing to. That's what he was telling us. Is that not amazing? The Tola'at God became a man. The man became a lamb. The lamb became a worm. Wow. Oh, the blood of Yeshua. This is precious blood. Let me focus us just quickly on the blood. This blood is incomparable. Nothing can match this blood. I give you first Kepha, first Peter 1, 18 and 19. You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life, which your fathers passed on to you, did not consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect or spot. Did you catch costly? It cost him everything. It cost him his life. This blood is indispensable. We've already said that in Hebrews 9.22. In fact, according to the Torah, almost everything is purified with blood. Indeed, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It is infinite in its value, the blood of the Messiah. Yochanan, John 1.29 told us that it was for the world, not for one, not for a period of time, it was for the world. And chapter one, verse seven of Yochanan, just a little earlier, the last part of the verse says, the blood of his son, Yeshua, purifies us from all sin. This blood has virtue. It has the power to deal with the enslavement of sin. Remember when we were talking about the 10 hardest things? Keep that in your mind. I'll come back to it. It has the power to deal with the enslavement. We are slaves to sin. Yochanan, John 8, 34 says, Yeshua answered them, yes, indeed, I tell you that everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Is there anyone who doesn't practice sin? No, no one lives perfectly. Even when we try, we don't live perfectly. But Ephesians 1, 7 says, in union with him, through the shedding of his blood, we are set free. Our sins are forgiven. That's redemption. They're not covered. They're not ignored. They're forgiven. They are washed away. They are gone forever. It has the power to deal with the estrangement of sin. Sin is what has separated us from God. Colossians 1.20 tells us through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made shalom, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, what brings us into reconciliation with God? Nothing else on heaven, in heaven, nothing else on earth. It's only that shed blood of Messiah. Ephesians 2.13, but now you who were once far off have been brought near. How? Through the shedding of the Messiah's blood. 
this blood, its virtue, it has the power to deal with the punishment of sin. Romans 6, 23, we know it well, the wages of sin is death. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us God made this sinless man, Yeshua, a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. It has a power to deal with the defilement of sin. Sin is what God said. We, we quoted already in Isaiah 118 that, that our sin is like the crimson, but it, we can be washed like the snow. Adonai says, let's talk this over together. That's what it means. Come, let us reason together. In that verse, he's saying, let's talk it over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they can be white as snow. Even if they're red stained crimson, they can be made white like wool that was pure white. Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us he made him, God made Yeshua, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you hear the blood crying out? They talk about the blood crying out from the ground of it all in his innocent murder. He, he did not die because of himself. He died because he was murdered. They talk about it in the catacombs. Well, hear the blood, hear its beat, hear its voice. It's a voice of pardon. Colossians 1.14, it is through his son that we have redemption. That is our sins have been forgiven. It's the voice of shalom, the voice of peace. Colossians 1.20, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Yochanan, John 14.27, what I am leaving with you is shalom, is peace. I'm giving you my shalom. I don't give it the way the world gives. Don't let yourselves be upset or frightened. Isaiah 26, 3. Yeshua 26, 3. You will keep him in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. If you're trusting in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, you have shalom. You have peace. That is power. This voice cries out pardon. This voice cries out shalom. This voice cries out power. While we were yet sinners, while we were helpless, he died for us. This is power. The Messiah died on behalf of ungodly people. And every single person from Adam to us and beyond us are ungodly. But the power to free us Hebrews 9.14, then how much more the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, will purify our conscience from works that lead to death so that we can serve the living God. And I'll sum it up in Revelation 22.11, the beginning of it. They defeated him, referring to Satan, they defeated him because of the Lamb's blood. It's the blood of the lamb. Remember, we've been talking about God wanting intimate fellowship with us, wanting to bring us up to the mountaintop, giving it the mountaintop experience to Moshe, to the 70 elders. Remember that, that as we're looking at that time, they broke the commandments before Moshe even brought them down, that God, Sadak, God out of his heart, he gifted, he gave us this free gift. His heart was poured out like wax. It was a sacrificial cost that cost the life of Yeshua. There was no substitute given, not even around like he did for Abraham and Yitzhak. God instead let his heart break. He died to help those in need. He died to help every human being. Remember the 10 things we started with, with the rabbi, the 10 things that are hard. And the last he said, love, charity, sadaka delivers from death. God was willing to do it all. God was willing to give it all. 
God being the only one deserving of the title, Sodic, righteous and just, he was the one who did it all. Now, when we hear and see that and see that love and feel it welling up within ourselves, I take us back into what this parasha started with, the free will offering, the giving of the heart. In our Brittachash, our New Covenant in 2 Corinthians 9, if you want to read it, start with verse 5, go through about verse 10. It talks about giving cheerfully, not giving out of that sense of duty, not giving because of compulsion, not giving because of the law, giving voluntarily, giving cheerfully, giving with the heart, that spontaneous, I want to give, that's flooding up hopefully inside of you right now because you are so thankful that he gave out of his heart. You want to give out of your heart. How do we do that? How do we give sadaka? How do we give to our God? How do we give cheerfully? How do we give voluntarily? Yes, we can with our finances and we should because we're showing him that when we give from our finances that we're trusting him to be our supplier. He gave it to us all anyway. It belongs to him. But yes, that's one way. But I think there was so much more. The children of Israel were, begin, give, were given an opportunity to find ways to give. How can we find ways to give today? How can we open up our heart, give out of the gener generosity of our heart? How can we give him our very heart? Because that's what I want to do. And I hear God say, you can give it in many ways. Yes, the pocketbook. But you can give I've given you a talent. He's given every single person a talent. Are you gifting your talent to the Lord? Your talent may be what you do for your income. Are you giving, are you doing your, your talent without getting that pay, giving it to the Lord? An example is someone who plays an instrument in an orchestra, gets paid for it, but then comes on Sunday mornings and plays in the church choir and doesn't get paid for it. They're giving their talent to the Lord. In that, they're giving their time to the Lord. Everyone's given 24 hours. Everyone's given seven days a week. Everyone's given 60 minutes and an hour. No one has more and no one has less. That's ours. And we choose how we spend it. Are you giving to the Lord in your time? And one of the greatest ways to give in your time is to give in prayer. Why do I say that? Because James said it. James 5, 16, the fervent prayer of a sonic, of a righteous man, avails much. Do you voluntarily give time in prayer? This is a gift you're giving to the Lord. You're giving him your heart. You're in this with a fervent prayer. And God says, yes, you're giving, but I'm going to give back to you more. It's going to avail much. That means it's going to accomplish much. You know, you can never out give God. You find a way and you get all excited and you give to God and he's going to give something back. And you're going to say, wow, I never can get even with you, God. I never can give you as much as you give to me. How, what's the ultimate? The open, ultimate to me is Romans 12. One. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship service. How do I worship my God? Give it me, give it me. Lord, lay me on the altar. You take me. You tell me how to spend my time. You tell me how to spend my finances. You tell me how to spend my talent. Lord, carte blanche, I'm yours. And I still haven't given him more than he's given me because he's given me eternal life. Yes, charity, that love, Sadaka, conquers death. What a God. What love. What life? Let it buoy you up and then go in the power of his spirit and so give. That's our Sadaka. That is Tamora, the greatest 
gift ever given. <sighs> Praise the Lord. That is the, 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 where we'll stop for today, but I pray it isn't stopping. I pray your mind is clicking, 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 and you, the Lord's taking you all over with him, through his blood, in his word, and to where he wants you to pour out your heart, showing someone else the love that we have received. Oh, where we left. We're late. I'm not going to do it on this end, but those who stay long enough and want to sing, oh, the blood, we've got it in Hebrew and English. We'll pull it up afterward, but I want to close us in prayer. I want to remember in prayer, um, Gracita, am I saying it right, Dosi? Gracita? Unmute yourself. <sighs> sorry. Benita. Benita, I'm sorry. I heard it wrong earlier. Benita, okay, who has just been diagnosed with breast cancer and has turned to Dosi for the help and support because she's seen this love of our God in Dosi. We want to join in prayer, pray for her. We want to pray for Steve's healing, Nora's husband. Um, was there one other? I thought there were three. Yes, her husband is in uh, intensive care. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, so we will pray for Benita, for her husband, for Steve, and any other prayer requests that are on your heart. As I close this in prayer, know that, that your prayer cried out to the Lord and is being included in this. And even our prayers come up into his nostrils as praise to him, because we know he is the God who answers prayer. The fervent prayer of a righteous soul, the righteous in him, avails much. One more. Yes, Dosi. Pray for my son. Okay. Okay. My He's body's not what I expect him to do. Okay. And what God is expecting him to do. Okay. Okay. Adonai Yeshua, Lamb of God, Seha Elohi. Oh, how we do praise and thank you for the shed blood. Powerful enough to wash away our sins. Powerful enough to give us life eternal. Powerful enough to conquer death. Yes, the sacrificial gift of our amazing God touches us, fills us with joy, heals us, saves us, and brings us into his glory that we might serve you. Lord, I have only begun. I know this is kindergarten, but Lord, take us from kindergarten and graduate us. See our hearts. See that we're living sacrifices on the altar to you pouring ourselves out, giving you carte blanche to use our time, our talents, our everything, our very soul and being to honor you, to serve you, to share with others that they might too learn of this great love and be set free. Oh, thank you that we know that we are. Lord, thank you we can lift up into your presence the names of those on our hearts. Benita, even miraculous healing from the breast cancer. Nancy, who's going through the treatments, Lord, complete healing. If, if it be pleasing to you to heal Benita without treatment, we pray for that. Otherwise, Lord, carry her through this time. May she know the rock of her salvation. May her husband right there in intensive care know that you are in that very room with him, wanting to hold him and comfort him and give him shalom beyond his circumstances. Lord, may he know it. May he feel it. And may any others who are sick and in need of healing, may they also know the comfort, the grace, the balm of Gilead, the, the eternal shalom, even if it is as you usher us into your presence. If we come home through sickness, we are still healed. We just get that eternal healing and we praise you and thank you for that. But we thank you that you also reach down to earth and heal in the midst of us now. Lord, we pray for everyone who is on our hearts, whatever the need be, mind, body, soul, and spirit. And that we bring to you, Dosi's son, and we bring to you all the sons like him that need that touch, that need to yield, that need to follow, that need direction, that need salvation, whatever it is, Lord, we pray. Salvation first, that they might have you within, that they could hear your voice and follow the way, because Lord, you do have a future and a hope for every single creation. Oh, we can't thank you enough. 
We can't praise you enough. We can't comprehend it. We can't contain it. We can't hold it in. But Lord, let your light so shine that these on earth around us will see you, come to know you, and glorify our Father in heaven. Thank you for saving man. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving so. Oh, Lord, we want to love you in that same capacity. Enable us through the power of your blood to do so in your holy name, which we can say because we are one with you. Hallelujah. Praise you. Amen.